everybody. Thank you for joining me at GraphQL Conf. Today, I'm going to be talking about getting started with GraphQL in an enterprise. In this talk today, we're going to talk about what is GraphQL and why would you want to use GraphQL. I'll give a very brief introduction of what GraphQL is and who in the world is using GraphQL. Then we'll talk about what were the challenges that PayPal was facing, which led us to adopt GraphQL in enterprise. I'll also talk about some of the mistakes that we made and how you can get started with GraphQL in your enterprise if you're interested. Before we dive forward, I want to start with my introduction. My name is Shruti Kapoor. I have been a senior software engineer at PayPal for the last three years. And the most fun part of my job has been working on a GraphQL layer and especially working with all of the challenges that come with adopting GraphQL and enterprise. In this talk, I want to share some of those experiences, but also the lessons that we learned. You can find me on Twitter at Shruti Kapoor 08. I will also be tweeting out the link of this talk afterwards. You can also find me on Twitch, where I stream co-working sessions on twitch.tv slash Shruti Kapoor. If you're interested in any GraphQL tidbits or JavaScript tidbits, I also send out weekly newsletters on bit.ly slash Shruti Newsletter. On a personal note, I also wanted to say that working through this hard time is has been really hard for everybody and we have all been feeling it for the last two years pandemic fatigue is real like we sit back at home and we've been watching this present you probably watching this presentation from your home and it's really hard we don't get that collaboration with people anymore we don't have the feeling of you know actually walking into a conference and you know talking to other people which was probably the most fun part for me um and especially like what I've noticed that in the beginning of pandemic or like b before pandemic, I used to go to cafes and work from there. But ever since we've been forced to stay at home, I've had no motivation to work on my side projects or even work. And I really miss hanging out with people. I really miss like going to cafes and just sitting there and like looking at other people, drinking their coffee, getting their work done. I kind of miss that. And I know a lot of people have been feeling the same way. So I wanted to create a place for the community to come and hang out and do work on their side projects at the same time. And that's why I started this Twitch streaming session. So it's a co-working session where I invite you to bring your own side project. You can work on anything that you want. You could even be reading a book. I don't really care. But it's time for us to spend like two hours working together on something cool, something fun. So I hope that you'll join me there and also get one of your side projects done. In today's talk, we're going to talk about getting started with GraphQL and Enterprise. But before I start talking about our story of adoption at PayPal, I also want to talk about my story of how I got into, into GraphQL. Um, before I started working at PayPal, I had no idea about what GraphQL was. If somebody told me GraphQL, I'd probably used to think like, oh, it was something related to Graph CMS, but is it like a graph data type structure? I had no idea. So I was completely new to GraphQL as a technology itself. Once I started at PayPal, uh, the team that I was assigned to, my role was to create an app. It was kind of an internal tools app, but the idea was that it was an internal project and you were supposed to use almost five APIs, one of which we were building uh, brand new from scratch. It was a Rust API. And then we were also consuming four other APIs, but they were all owned by other teams. So basically we had one API that we were building from scratch, and then there were four apps four APIs that were being built by other teams. Most of the APIs that existed at the time were all REST APIs, and we were building a uh, brand new Node.js app. The state of GraphQL in 2018 was also quite new. Um, we, in, in 2018 at PayPal, we were slowly picking up GraphQL. Um, one of the major teams that was, the, was, that was the trailblazer of GraphQL was the checkout team. Um, and and there weren't there wasn't much support uh there wasn't especially any infra support at the time for adopting graphql it was kind of being taken on by teams one bit at a time as a side project really so it was slowly picking up in the community as well um even outside in the community the graphql as a language had been picking up slowly 
But since 2018, a lot has changed. There have been so many different companies, especially enterprise companies that are using GraphQL in production. As you see here, here in the second second row, um, there's Twitter and Facebook, Lyft, KLM, Intuit, um, Audi, Atlassian, all of almost all of the big companies are using GraphQL now in production. There's also GraphQL Foundation, which helps in maintaining the spec, and PayPal is a part of GraphQL. So we as a company have heavily invested in the technology, but we're also giving back to the community. Um, for example, talks like this. GraphQL itself um, as a spec has been implement can be implemented by different languages. So for example, JavaScript is the one that we are using most commonly. GraphQL JS, as you can see here, is being maintained and used by a lot of different people. So it's a very common um, and very stable um, technology as of now. GraphQL also turned out to be the highest interest, the language that people have the most interest in um, by, state, by stateofjs.com uh, 2020 survey. So if you're interested in learning GraphQL, this is a really good time to learn GraphQL. Over the last few years, we have also invested heavily in GraphQL. Um, PayPal has been, right now we have almost 50 apps in production that are using GraphQL. Um, Braintree also came out with its public API, which is uh, in GraphQL. In our internal community, we have almost 500 members in the Slack channel which are, who are using GraphQL. So as a company, we are quite heavily using GraphQL. Um, over the last few years, we have developed support for adding GraphQL to our apps including internal tools that help us deploy applications. Uh, we have provided infra support by the Node, uh, Node Infra team to uh, spin up a GraphQL server and a GraphQL client-side app. We also provide training materials within the company itself to learn GraphQL. Um, now, anytime an app is being built, the default pattern is usually to use GraphQL. And it is being used across the board by multiple teams across PayPal. For example, the checkout team, the payments team. Um, I wanna talk about some of the reasons why we decided to adopt GraphQL as a company. And to talk about that, we should talk about the challenges we were facing at the time. So initially all of our APIs were REST APIs. One of the biggest things that we were noticing was that we had so much data that we were fetching from our REST APIs, especially app uh, APIs that were being used only for internal work. There was so much data that was being coming, but we weren't re really using all of that data. So a lot of the data was actually uh, being sent that nobody else was consuming. Um, so we had a big overfetching problem uh, in our client-side apps. We also noticed that to get, um, to get data from one endpoint, we would have to make multiple round trips before just to get to that endpoint. For example, let's say that we are trying to get user's profile information. Maybe there is an endpoint called slash user profile. And maybe that endpoint accepts like a ID or a username. So just to get that ID, we'll also have to make another REST call. So as clients, we had to first figure out where can we get those parameters. So like where can we get those IDs? Where can we get those usernames? So this way we're making a lot of round trips as client-side apps. Another problem that we noticed is that whenever we would send out an um, update, the clients th that were already integrated with a certain version would not get that updates because maybe we updated it to a new version. So they, they would have to basically reintegrate their app into a new version of, of the API. So if they were integrated with a previous version like a V2, they would, be, they would not get our updates. So it was hard for us to keep our clients updated. Another problem that we noticed was that because our developer, uh, because our developer APIs were being built by different teams across the board, um, sometimes even the same field would be named differently. So there was a very different integration experience. Maybe something was ca called ID in one, and it was called something else in another API. So to that became a, that became really hard for people to integrate across um, different APIs across the board because it was providing a very different integration experience. The documentation would be different and some of the APIs would use a different API naming convention. So it became a really difficult integration experience to uh, integrate with multiple APIs across the board. 
So when we were looking for a candidate, it became important for us that the candidate not only help us solve the challenges, but also provide us certain things that we were looking for for the right uh, candidate. Um, we did uh, one of the biggest things that we wanted the can the the API candidate to do for us was uh, provide us freedom to use any language that we wanted plus also provide freedom to the client to use any language they wanted so the freedom of tech was an important factor for us another important thing that we wanted uh, our um, new technology to provide us was the freedom to choose any language any programming language that we wanted for example this was really important when we were building the braintree SDK or the braintree API um, we did want to have to convert our SDKs to different languages depending on the client or the server needs. We wanted to provide one specific API that anybody could use and that's why becoming and that's why GraphQL became an important factor when you wanted to build like a uniform uniform unified uh, API or a, a single API that m multiple merchants could use. Um, another important factor was that um, every flow in PayPal has its own Node.js app and every app has its own implementation of React.js. So we wanted to provide a layer that would provide us like a uniform uh, front-end experience while also giving us a backend to orchestrate the APIs. We wanted it to be easy to integrate with this API across the board. So for example, if there were companies or there were subsidiaries or there were other teams that had not worked with our API before, they we did, wanted that they shouldn't have to have any prior knowledge before integrating with our API. And this became really important when we were using uh, this technology, when we were building a unified API to build identity apps, because we wanted to be able to integrate with identity uh, API without having to have prior knowledge of what else is required for PayPal domain. At the same time, we also wanted detailed analytics because we wanted to understand what is all the data that the client is fetching because we had a problem of overfetch data. So we wanted to make sure that we are only sending exact information or only the, that data that is being useful to the client. And so one of the common things that we started hearing across the board or started noticing amongst our developers was that anytime we'd update a new, we'd send out a new feature or a new update, a common conversation we would have is somebody, a developer on the team would say that we need to add new data. But then the question we'd ask ourselves is, should we add it as a versioned API? Adding a versioned API is usually a good approach if we have any breaking changes. But the problem is, what if we add a versioned API, but the client, the client who's already integrated with the older version doesn't have, it doesn't want to reintegrate or does still wants the update, but doesn't want, uh, or, or, or we don't, like how do we provide that update to them without having to reintegrate? That was a problem with the versioned API. Another option is that if we do need to ask for more data, how do we send that? Or how do we ask for that? We could probably create a new endpoint, but do we create a completely new endpoint or should we add like a query param to an existing endpoint? But then what happens to the existing endpoint? Do we, are, are we just, um, populating our existing endpoint and are we just um, polluting the existing endpoint by adding multiple query params? Adding a new endpoint or adding an existing or adding query params helps with people who are already integrated with a certain version. But then there's always all these trade-offs we're making whenever we're making whenever we are adding a new endpoint. And so GraphQL came up to be and so GraphQL turned out to be a candidate that would solve all of those problems for us. So some of the reasons you wanted GraphQL seemed um, really enticing to us is because we have the concept of one endpoint. So we can push as many updates as we want. We don't have to add any query params. We don't have to add any new endpoints. So we can add as much uh, data as we want to our GraphQL endpoint. And because everybody would be integrated with the GraphQL endpoint, 
we don't have any versioning anymore. So the updates are delivered as and when they are ready and as and when the client is ready to integrate with them. One cool thing about GraphQL is that it provides you feed because every field has a re resolver. That means we can have field level instrumentation. And so that became really important to us because now we could add and deprecate fields as we needed to. And with GraphQL, because the client dictates exactly the data they want and how much data they want, it became easier for us to fetch less data from the endpoints. As a developer, we were really excited about GraphQL because all of the tools that GraphQL empowers, like graphical um, uh, playground, um, that made it really easy for us as developers to check out the, um, the uh, to explore the API, but also fire up a fire up request at the same time. So it became really easy for us to see what's going on in the API without having to switch like multiple different windows or without having to even switch to multiple different apps. Uh, and because we have to uh, talk about schema before we start developing, it's kind of like a contract that we need to establish between teams. It made sure that we were talking to our backend teams, to our UX designers, because the UI now started powering our schema. So we started developing like these UI powered schemas, which were powering our UI apps. So that meant that we increased the collaboration between our team. We were talking to our backend engineers, we we're talking to our front end engineers and to our UX developers. And that helped increase collaboration across the teams. Um, because schema is established as a contract, so that meant that the front-end developers could go and work on their front-end API independently, and back-end developers could work on their back-end API in independently without having to depend on each other. So as developers, we really like GraphQL because the productivity tools that it provides made it much easier for us to explore um, our APIs uh, our APIs, and also file requests at the same time, which prob was probably my favorite part. Um, now, if you are interested in adopting GraphQL in your own company, here are some approaches of adopting GraphQL in an enterprise. The first one is that you can have a GraphQL wrapper over REST APIs. And this is probably the most common technique of using GraphQL in an enterprise. So what happens is that let's say that you have a REST API, you can convert all your REST APIs. No, I'm just kidding. Basically what you can do is you can convert your REST API into a GraphQL API and see if that GraphQL API fits your needs. So this way you don't have to turn down everything that's REST API or, or put your apps down, but you can slowly con start converting one API into a GraphQL API and see if it fits your needs. Um, this is also really good for cases where um, in enterprises where most of the APIs are built in REST API, but we need kind of like a UI powered API uh, or a UI driven API to consume those downstream APIs. So in that case, that facade, that gateway layer can be the GraphQL layer, but then GraphQL in turn talks to multiple different REST APIs at the end of the day. Um, another technique is to have a REST wrapper over GraphQL API. And usually the companies that adopt this approach are the ones that need to support both REST APIs and GraphQL APIs, or at least needs to support REST APIs. So this way you don't have to have two different APIs communicating, or like you don't have to maintain two different APIs, but instead you can build your ground up layer as a GraphQL API layer, but then just to support the REST layers or the REST clients, you can have a REST wrapper over GraphQL API. Another common technique or another technique that you can adopt is that your GraphQL and REST layers coexist. Um, and one way to do that is that GraphQL endpoint is for certain things, whereas REST APIs is for certain things. Um, one way to divide that is by different market segments. So if you think that one market segment makes more sense to be a, a, um, a UI driven approach or a GraphQL layer, then that can um, work at the same time as your REST layer. So some business logic can live in GraphQL layer, some business logic can live in REST layer. So those are the three, three different approaches of adopting GraphQL in an enterprise. Um, let's talk about how we started fitting GraphQL at PayPal. When we started uh, plugging GraphQL in API, we wanted to start experimenting with our existing APIs. And we wanted to pick 
projects that had relatively low impact. So that's why the project that I started working on in GraphQL was a really good candidate for trying out GraphQL uh, because it was a project that was an internal project but also had uh, had very low impact in terms of customer impact. So uh, we had the room to kind of like play around with GraphQL and experiment with GraphQL. So that's why kind of like that try first app would be a really good approach. Um, another way that you can, another way that we thought of uh, adopting GraphQL is also by building standard alone APIs. So these are APIs that were building were being built for the very first time. And so what we started doing was um, if an if a new API was supposed to be built, we would build it in GraphQL and see if we could consume it that way. Another way to have uh, a GraphQL coexisting with REST APIs is again to craft uh, orchestrate um, existing APIs as GraphQL APIs. And this was specifically helpful for teams that were more front end heavy. Um, at PayPal, there were two main approaches that we took to adopt GraphQL. So the, the the main trailblazer, the guiding light for us was the checkout app. And the app that I was working on was the was the merchant app. Um, in in PayPal, the the one uh, the checkout app is the one that has a, a big GraphQL layer. Um, and it incorporates or it orchestrates existing GraphQL, uh, existing REST APIs, but also any new business logic that is being built is also within that GraphQL layer. This GraphQL layer is being used by multiple different teams within the checkout app. Another approach that we also have in multiple other teams is the approach that we had in the merchant app, which is GraphQL kind of comes out to be as this pure orchestration layer. Um, and this is specifically useful for teams that are just consuming APIs, but they are not going to be like writing to APIs. So it's kind of like a get based or like a post, just a post based, um, I guess just a get based uh, app. So these are apps that are not, they, that they don't own their data, but they're just gonna be like getting and putting the data. Um, and in this sense, GraphQL can also become like a really good orchestrator. So GraphQL basically like um, proxies the requests that are supposed to go to REST API endpoint. And this becomes really uh, useful, especially when you're talking to multiple different APIs. So um, I talked about the first kind of like the try the first app. I want to talk a little bit more about that first app. So we were creating a new internal tool. So that's why the impact on the business was very small. But one of our biggest goal was we wanted to reduce the data that we were sending to our client side app. So our first app was kind of like a client app. We built a React.js layer. Our goal was to reduce the data that we were sending to this layer. And so what we wanted to make sure is that we didn't, we didn't want to add any additional library if, if it wasn't needed, but also we didn't want to fetch any additional code if it wasn't needed. And so that's why GraphQL became like a really good candidate because with the help of GraphQL, we were able to get rid of our Redux state management library. And even though GraphQL is not a state management library, but just with the help of adding, uh, of like removing the code that we were actually sending to our REST API or to our uh, React layer, we didn't have to store and format all of that data on the client side. So that basically meant that our network requests became really fast. And so anytime on load, if we didn't have to, we were not actually storing our data on the, st on the state side as well. It was an internal tool where we were just like fetching the data and then uh, letting the user add inputs and posting the data. So we had, we had very, light state management needs. And so we totally got rid of our Redux layer. So this way we were able to get to shave off extra libraries from our app. Um, we also knew that because we were consuming multiple different APIs, GraphQL became, uh, GraphQL was really good because it was, GraphQL works really well as an orchestration layer. And so this became so GraphQL became like a really good candidate that we can use for an orchestration layer. One of the good things about having um, GraphQL as an orchestration layer is that you can still keep uh, you can still get to have um, and especially it's useful for teams that do not have much ownership over downstream APIs. So you can still reap all of the benefits of GraphQL, but you have don't have to change anything that's underneath. Um, and I have noticed, and oftentimes we'd notice that GraphQL would face some resistance from people who are on the backend side. So even though, um, even though 
you as front end developers or the ui teams may want to use graphql there may be some resistance from the back end developers and so using it as an orchestration layer also helps in kind of working on uh, like having that graphql facade that you can still talk to the rest apis so another cool thing that i think about, uh, th that i think graphql uh, empower gives us is that it helps us evolve our api over time so because we've established a graphql uh, a schema contract between the teams everyone knew what to expect and they were able to work independently and anytime we had to build our schema um, we used to look at what the ui needs were um, and so if it was required but the ui would add it to the schema and then everybody else was able to consume that schema as well one of the things that we have at PayPal is that our GraphQL and REST APIs are uh, live together. So that helps us keep our architectural APIs at the same time, or that helps us keep our legacy APIs at the same time while building new uh, APIs in GraphQL. So our current adoption approach is that most of our frontier applications are now moving to GraphQL and GraphQL has become kind of like the UI default pattern for building apps or a default pattern for building UI apps. Um, our mid-tier applications are now starting to move to GraphQL. Um, we are facing some hes hesitancy and some resistance from our backend teams, but that's okay because we, as long as we're still able to consume GraphQL, it's okay. We don't have to boil the ocean. Um, most of our teams currently have their own GraphQL endpoints. So we're, we're kind of uh, adopting GraphQL on a team by team basis, um, but we are also moving towards a federated one graph approach as a company. So um, how GraphQL helped our two main goals. The first one was the performance and sending less data to the client. Um, and GraphQL helped us because the clients actually determined and um, uh, owned how much data they wanted. So they had the power of asking for as much data as they need. And because they didn't have to format any of the data anymore because they asked for the exact shape of the data, they didn't have to have any uh, client-side formatting of the data, which helped them remove any additional code and libraries like Redux. Um, another big goal that we had was developer productivity. So we wanted to make sure that we were building our apps fast and tools like Graphical and, um, and um, uh, Playground helped us because they helped us explore our API right away. And also it helped us prevent like finding out which API is where and like f um, finding out the different dependencies of different APIs. Um, we were also able to ship features fast because we knew that if we shipped out a feature into our graphical endpoint, um, any of the uh, clients that are integrated with the endpoint would be able to fetch it whenever they are ready. So we didn't have to worry about breaking anybody's uh, code or like not providing update to anybody. Um, breaking anybody's code because um, if we saw that there was, uh, the, that because we have instrumentation of our, our APIs, if we saw that somebody was running that query or somebody was asking for that field, we knew that we shouldn't deprecate that field just yet. And if we did want to deprecate, we can use um, a directive called deprecate that can help inform that that this, um, this field is going to go away in the future. So because of this, you're able to intelligently evolve our APIs. While we were uh, developing GraphQL and we while we were um, advocating for GraphQL, there was some common questions that most people asked us, and I'm going to quickly go over these. One of the first ones was that you need a graph type database for GraphQL, which is actually one of the biggest misconceptions that I had as well. But actually, you don't need a graph type database or even a graph type data for your GraphQL. What you do need is a um, relationship between the different data types that you're going to have. So for example, if, a, if we have a user type, how does that relate to, let's say, um, an ID? or how does that relate to, let's say, a, a notification profile. So that's the kind of relationship of data that you have to think of because that way you can inherit from one data. That way you can like link one data type to another data type. That's the graph of the GraphQL. Another misconception people had was if it was similar to SQL layer or if it was um, going to be sitting on top of the database. But actually, GraphQL is not similar to SQL. Um, SQL um, GraphQL defines a query language for fetching your API, your GraphQL API, um, but it is used to query an API, not the database. Um, 
Another question that most people, most backend engineers had was that GraphQL is only for JavaScript developers. But actually, GraphQL can be implemented anywhere and it can be implemented in any language. GraphQL is actually a spec. So if you want to implement GraphQL in a language of your choice, you totally can. GraphQL JS just happens to be one of the most popular libraries for implementing GraphQL. Another common question we had from most of our teams was that all the services I have in REST and I don't want to burn them down. And that's totally okay. A GraphQL layer can totally live in, side by side with REST layers. Um, another common question that people have in the community is that I have sensitive data or that I don't want to expose um, um, that I don't want to expose my, my APIs to the public or that I don't want to expose my database to the public. And that's totally fine. Like you don't have to expose anything that you don't want to. It's the same way as how an API would work. You can still have authentication and authorization implemented on your GraphQL layer and you only choose and you choose only what you want to expose. Um, I also heard that people think that GraphQL do, uh, doesn't support auth, but actually uh, existing auth can uh, live at the same uh, uh, side by side with GraphQL. There are some modifications you'll need to make so that GraphQL accepts your auth tokens and such, but they can totally live together. <laughs> and that I don't want to expose my entire database, but again, you can choose what you want to expose. So. We, I also want to talk about some lessons that we learned during this journey. The first biggest lesson that we learned as a company was to pick our first app. Um, in our team, that turned out to be the demo app that we were building. But within Checkout, that turned out to be the app that they were working on. So it's a really good idea to pick like a small demo app or small app that you can kind of use to experiment GraphQL on and see if GraphQL really is a good technology or a good fit for you. Another cool thing that we learned that was, I guess, one of the best practices was to build schema together. Um, and this was really helpful because it helped bring our teams closer, improve communication and collaboration between the teams. A big theme that we learned about GraphQL was that GraphQL's power is an orchestration, um, especially in enterprises. So if you don't want to change the entire stack, the entire layers of REST APIs, don't worry, just orchestrate that. Another big lesson that I learned in my first app was to not do a one-to-one -one mapping of a REST to GraphQL. And so what ended up happening was that I we had this app, we uh, this API that we were building um, a GraphQL layer for, but the REST API was also being built at the same time as GraphQL layer, and the REST API was the exact one-to-one -one mapping of a GraphQL layer. So anytime we added a new field, we'd add it to the REST layer, then we'd add it to the GraphQL layer. And so what ended up happening was basically we added a lot of boilerplate just to do that one-to-one -one mapping. And because we're not like filtering any more data, we're just like transferring exactly the data that REST throws it all the way to uh, the client side. This actually led to adding a lot more boilerplate to the to our API. So just to make a new update, we'd have to update in three different places. And so a big lesson was to not use GraphQL to do like a one-to-one -one mapping of REST because then you're just not using GraphQL for its advantages. Um, another thing that GraphQL provides us was uh, free type safety because every field has to have the same type. So if it's a string, it needs to be a string. You cannot pass an integer. That was really cool because now we got like free TypeScript basically and TypeScript support. Um, but word of caution before you start adopting GraphQL, um, your GraphQL API will only be as performant as your slowest endpoint. Oftentimes people have a misconception that um, GraphQL Im magically improves performance, but it doesn't. If your orchestration layer is consuming an API that is very slow, GraphQL will still be slow. Some of the challenges of GraphQL that we faced in our company were, um, especially a big challenge was caching an error mapping, which is actually still being, um, still being, still a challenge with GraphQL. So basically what happens is that um, GraphQL sends everything as a 200. And if you need uh, any validation errors, or if you need to show or have a different business logic for different types of errors, for example, 400, 404, 500, you'll actually have to do some parsing of the error object that GraphQL sends back. 
and for one of the apps we were doing we had to do like really low level um, field level um, mapping of the errors that we were uh, seeing and so that made it really hard to work with GraphQL because we'll have to because everything is a 200 so we'll have to like dig deep into the GraphQL object into the error object to find out exactly what error is being thrown but also which field it was being thrown for so there are some there are some problems there um, the other thing is that when you don't know exactly what schema you need or when you don't know what query a client could fetch um, that could be a problem uh, because you need to know the schema upfront for GraphQL API. So when you have an unknown schema, it becomes really hard to um, to have this exhaustive list of types and queries and mutations that your GraphQL can support. Um, we are also facing some challenges making a one graph across our teams because we all have different GraphQL, uh, GraphQL endpoints and we are all in different stages of our GraphQL adoption. So creating a one graph with multiple smaller teams and smaller graphs has been a problem because now we have to think about who's going to be on the graph, who is the right candidate to be on the graph and things like that. Next steps for you if you want to start adopting GraphQL is first assess um, what are the current architecture problems that you are facing in your company and who is who is the API developer and consumer. And if you have any company specific uh, items, for example, authorization, any tools that you're using for analytics or monitoring, and if you do introduce GraphQL, where do you plan to fit these in? Um, Another important thing to think about is, are you building everything from ground up or are you going to be orchestrating everything or wrapping everything? Um, how will you enforce standards and how will you um, uh, uh, teach your, or how will you train your teams? Um, the other thing uh, is, when you, especially when you want to convince leadership, is how do you measure lead, uh, success? Um, would it be based on the performance of the app or developer productivity or time to market? So all of those are really important things about considering uh, about uh, to consider before adopting um, GraphQL. So if you do want to adopt GraphQL, a big thing, a big way to prepare yourself would be to do a similar exercise of figuring out a small app uh, that that you can that you can kind of try GraphQL on. Once you feel that GraphQL is a good uh, technology for you, set up a standards team that will help to um, to to solve some of those problems, some of those infra problems you may have. That will help you incorporate some of your existing tools like analytics and authorization and things like that. Um, set up some uh, training resources for your teams to adopt GraphQL and determine how you're going to scale. So how are you going to share uh, knowledge between the teams and how are you going to advocate for adoption? Um, also, there are tons of libraries out there that can help you um, overcome some of these problems. So for example, Apollo One Graph, Apollo Federation um, helps in creating a one graph. So that's, um, so also explore what other libraries you can use. So do an exercise of build versus buy. <laughs> Now, if you do want to sell this to your team, I would probably focus on the collaboration between teams and how GraphQL helps in improving communication between teams. And I'll, to, uh, to convince your developers, I'd focus on the tooling and the dev productivity. I'd also recommend having an incremental adoption approach in adopting GraphQL. Cool thing about GraphQL is that it doesn't have any version, so everybody gets all the all the um, updates that you want to push. And it's very similar to JSON, so it's very easy for developers to understand because the syntax feels familiar. I'd also recommend getting your architects and your domain experts on board so they can truly understand the problems that GraphQL is trying to solve and that whether or not it's a right fit for you. Now to wrap up. I would say that GraphQL is here to stay and it is becoming more and more popular these days. So definitely pick up that technology if you're interested, but at the same time, no technology is perfect. So GraphQL has its challenges as well. So think about whether GraphQL would be a good fit for you before you uh, get on board the hype train. And if you do uh, uh, if you do consider GraphQL, definitely get involved with the community because the community has been building lots of great resources and lots of great tools to help the adoption of GraphQL. 
Um, we do have blog posts that we have published. Mark Stewart from our team has published a GraphQL blog post on our Medium blog. You can find it on medium.com slash PayPal tech. Success story for PayPal checkout. Maybe we talk more in detail about the checkout side of our store of our uh, GraphQL adoption and the app that helped that was a guiding light for the rest of our company. I'll also have a blog post coming out soon talking about our adoption of GraphQL in the enterprise. So do check it out at medium.com slash PayPal tech. There are so many other companies who've gone through the same journey as us. And there's lots of blog posts out there. But these are the th these are the two that I really wanted to highlight. At the same time, Mark Andre's book about production ready GraphQL is gold standard. So definitely give that a check. With that, I want to say thank you so much. Again, you can find me on Twitter at ShrutiKapoor08 or on Twitch, or you can subscribe to this newsletter to get more updates. You can find all of these slides on this URL, github.com slash ShrutiKapoor08 slash talks. I will be publishing this talk there. Before I leave, I want to send one final dev joke. Thank you so much.